Thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, my name is Emily Knight and I am a manager with the Lundfest Ocean Program. Uh, I wanna start today by offering a land acknowledgement for where we are, at least in Washington, DC. From the coast to the deep water and across boundaries and borders, we would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the indigenous peoples that have called these lands and waters home since time immemorial. Washington DC sits on the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, also do documented as Nakotchtank, and the neighboring Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples. So for those of you who do not know the Lenfest Ocean Program, we are a grant-making program that funds ocean and coastal research to address the needs of managers, policymakers, stakeholders, and more. Um, and our approach to that, and this is important for the discussion we're gonna have today, is twofold, uh, scoping and co-design, and then sustained outreach and engagement. When a new research idea comes to us, we work to bring the research researchers together with the folks that could potentially use the work to co-develop the research questions and structure the project. Then as the work gets underway, we develop with our grantees a collaborative outreach plan to engage audiences throughout the project's life. And that's why we're here today. This part, this event is part of an outreach plan we've been implementing uh, for several years now. So Marine Biodiversity Dialogues. Um, it is now two expert task forces, uh, the first of which began in 2020 to develop a framework to assess the abundance and distribution of marine biodiversity in U.S. waters, including what is inside and outside existing protections. And the second task force began in 2022 to build on the work of the first and to apply the framework in key case study regions, as well as flesh out the connections between marine biodiversity and ecosystem function and resilience. And so I will actually drop into the chat a blog written by my coworker, uh, Jason Landrum, that actually describes both of these task forces and provides links to their respective web presence. So today you will hear from members of both task forces who are with us on the screen today, as well as key partners. Um, and so right now what I want to do is a round of introduction with all of our panelists, as well as our Lenfest colleagues. So if Lenfest colleagues, you also wanna come on camera, um, I'm gonna popcorn around and have folks introduce themselves and their role with the work. Um, and I will start with you, Emmett. Hi, everyone. Uh, Emmett Duffy. I'm at, at the Smithsonian Institution, the Smithsonian uh, Environmental Research Center. I'm a marine ecologist by training and uh, have strong interests in marine biodiversity and ecosystem processes and currently leading the Smithsonian's Marine Geo Program. And uh, I'm happy to be uh, leading this project with my some of my colleagues that you'll meet. Cool. Um, Sarah? Actually, panelist Sarah. <laughs> I was like, there's two Sarahs. <laughs> Common name. Um, thanks. So I'm Sarah Jeannie Wolfson. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and I am leading the first of multiple papers that is coming out of this um, project. And I will tell you a little bit about our data today. Great. And I'll go over to Pat. Hi. Pat Halpin, I direct the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab at Duke University. We worked on provisioning um, and doing some of the analysis of data to support the first part of this project. Thank you. Cool, Jesse. Hi folks, I'm Jesse Cleary, a geographer and marine data scientist in the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab at Duke. And I contributed to the spatial analysis portion of task one that you'll hear about today, thanks. Great, Gabrielle. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Canonico from NOAA and the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System, where I've been uh, serving as the federal coordinator for the U.S. Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And I'm a co-lead with uh, Emmett and Stephen on the phase two that you'll hear about later. Stephen? 
Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Cyphers. I'm an associate professor in the School of Marine and Environmental Sciences and the Department of Sociology here at the University of South Alabama. Uh, I'm also a senior marine scientist at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab, and I'm part of the second task force. So thanks for joining us. Nice to meet you all. Chris? Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Siri. I'm the managing director of Go Blue, which is a consulting firm working with a variety of stakeholders on natural resource policy. I'm also the former CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, where I had the privilege of working with this outstanding group of individuals and many more um, on the work that they're going to be discussing today. Great. And I'll go to my LenFest colleagues, Charlotte. Hi all, Charlotte Hudson. I direct the Lenfest Ocean Program, which is based at the Pew Charitable Trust, as Emily mentioned. And Vicki? Hi everyone, I'm the Senior Digital Associate for the Lenfest Ocean Program, um, and I'm on the back end of this live tweeting if anyone is interested in joining the conversation online. <laughs> and last but not least, Sarah. Hi everyone, Sarah Close. I'm a Senior Program Officer or with Lundfest Ocean Program, uh, stepping in to help out today in case any technical issues arise. So I will be in the background, hopefully not needed. <laughs> Thank you all. And I see people introducing themselves in the chat, which is wonderful. Feel free to drop resources and share things in there. Um, so like I said, you're going to be hearing from leadership of both these task forces, as well as um, our director from the Lenfest Ocean Program and key partners in the work uh, of the work, which is Chris Sari, who's been with this from the beginning. And I also want to acknowledge the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation, which as an organization has been a great partner. Um, for our agenda, we'll hear from both of them first. Then we will have presentations from the members of the two task forces, but then we'll have a moderated Q&A between Chris and the panel, and we'll have plenty of time for audience Q&A after that. Um, the last thing I want to say before running through logistics and introducing our first speakers is that these two task forces are part of a portfolio of projects that we're funding on the topic of understanding marine bi biodiversity. So you, some of you may have joined us in March for our virtual event on understanding the ecological diversity of the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, um, and I will drop the web presence in the chat in a moment for that. But also later this year, we will have another project that will center Hawaiian knowledge and perspectives in developing historical baselines for near shore ecosystem marine biodiversity. And the web presence for that work is actually forthcoming. It'll probably be a little later, a little later in the fall. But I wanted to mention, I wanted to mention this portfolio of projects because what they all share is wanting to highlight the importance of managing for marine biodiversity and its value for ecosystem health as well as for people. And you know, they are all attempting to explore historical and current dimensions of marine biodiversity from multiple perspectives. You know, Western science, indigenous knowledge, and you'll hear a little bit of, about this for Task Force 2, including the perspective of, of stakeholders and other local experts. So we invite you to engage with us on all of this work. We'll, we'll be doing outreach, writing materials, and setting up venues for continued dialogue and debate about all of it. So the last thing I'll say is webinar logistics. All attendees are muted. Um, this is to prevent feedback. Uh, we will have time at the end for questions. Use the Q&A panel to type and submit your question at any point during the webinar today, and we'll keep track of the queue. And we will read it aloud to the panelists at the end. Um, if you put questions in the chat, we will try to go between both of them, but we like to try to reserve chat for people sharing comments or resources and then keeping the questions in the Q&A panel. But we will, be, we will look at both and do the best we can. Um, depending on how many questions, we may not get to them all, but please do follow up with us, follow up with the researchers. This is being recorded and we will share the recording afterwards. So with that, I am now going to turn it over to Charlotte Hudson of the Lundfest Ocean Program. Charlotte? Thanks so much, Emily. And 
thank you all again for being here. I know a webinar these days in the middle of uh, end of July is maybe the last place you'd like to be on, on this afternoon, but we're very uh, excited to share a lot of this information with you. So I briefly just wanted to give a little bit of background of how the Lindfest Ocean Program came to have a portfolio in marine biodiversity at all, um, just to set a little bit of the context about how we think about the issue. Um, so 20 years ago or so, when the program started in 2004, as Emily mentioned, our focus was on to support science that fills gaps in information needed for decision making. And at the time, we were really focused on sustainable fisheries management. How do we get more science into decision makers' hands to be able to have sustainable fisheries and sustainable oceans? We quickly, of course, transitioned to thinking about that in the ecosystem-based way, so focused on ecosystem-based management, habitats, and looking more holistically about the oceans, which then naturally led us to, but what about all the other components in the oceans that aren't necessarily already in the models or in um, stock assessments? And we found that, you know, there's a lot of conversations about the important role of marine biodiversity, not only for ecosystem structure and function, but resilience. And of course, with the climate crisis we're in right now, a lot of us are pointing to marine biodiversity as critical pieces of, of that puzzle. But we also found that we didn't quite understand whether these functional roles that we were hoping were out there were actually being maintained or sustainable. Um, and whether any of those areas that had high levels of marine biodiversity were actually in currently protected areas. Um, you'll hear much more about this today, but I will also say that I would like to acknowledge that this work stands on the shoulders of giants, many of whom are in the webinar today. You know, this did not come out of nowhere. It has built on many years of work that many individuals in the field have been pursuing. And, and just to acknowledge that, we are excited to carry this forward in, in ways that are supportive, but we also want to recognize all of those that came before us. So Chris is going to speak a little bit about how we got into the, to the uh, part one and part two of the task force structure. Um, but I also wanted to acknowledge that as we were going through the scoping of thinking about a portfolio for marine biodiversity, we also um, realized, well, what's what is marine biodiversity, where is it, and whether it's protected actually really matters who you ask um, and whose information is put into that data gathering um, analysis. Um, you know, what type of knowledge is considered and what type of knowledge hasn't been considered. Um, as Emily mentioned, two projects that we have recently funded, which she shared a little bit about, are either co-designed or led by indigenous or native peoples, which is a portfolio area that is coming with, that is within this marine biodiversity portfolio. Um, specifically, I just want to mention this, not, uh, for those of you um, who might be, um, who might not have heard this, we did just open an open call, an actual request for proposals, which is about including indigenous knowledge and in ocean and coastal decision making. Um, this call seeks to fund projects that elevate indigenous peoples and in sharing their traditions, culture, knowledge, and wisdom to improve decision making for the oceans and coasts. Um, it's an RFP, a request for proposals that's open until October 16th this fall. Um, we're not going to talk more, I'm not going to mention more about it now, but you can learn all of this information is on our website and you can learn more about this opportunity. I think we'll drop a link in the chat. Um, and just so you know, on that page is also a webinar recording of a webinar we did, was that last week? Two weeks ago <laughs> at some point, um, which is uh, announcing the opportunity and, and uh, all of the answering questions and answers about what, um, what might be included in that. So thank you all for this, uh, for, for letting me speak. I tried to make it brief. I'm gonna let uh, Chris take it from here and, and then we'll get uh, turn it from there. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to all the panelists that are presenting today and everybody who's joining us um, for the webinar. We really appreciate it. So the US Ocean Climate Action Plan begins with a very simple yet fundamental truth. And that is there is no path to a healthy and livable climate without the ocean. And the critical path to help the ocean is effective management, including greater protection of ocean species and habitats and the functions and services that they provide. We all know we're placing more demands on our ocean um, for supportive offshore energy development, providing protein in the form of wild caught fisheries and aquaculture, regulating our climate, sequestering carbon, and so much more. 
So now more than ever, we need data, tools, and information that really help us facilitate conservation that protects the oceans and its resources for both nature and people. This is not unusual to us. In the 1980s, we faced a very similar problem um, on land. And the USGS decided to ask a very simple question. How well are we doing protecting common animals and plants? And they had a goal, and that was to keep common species common by identifying animals and plants in communities that were not adequately protected in existing conservation land network. And by bravely to provide these data, they hope to help land managers, policymakers, stakeholders, businesses make better informed decisions when identifying areas both for conservation and development. So this is very exciting work, not only because of the critical nature of the data and the information that we're gathering, it's also very exciting because we're finally developing this framework for the oceans. And I think as Charlotte really mentioned, this is very much the beginning of the process, but such a critical step as our ocean faces more demands, we ask more of it, and we really do wanna make sure that it's able to be there to provide and thrive for both current and future generations. So thank you very much for joining us. I'll turn it back over to Charlotte. Thanks so much, Chris. And now <laughs> the main event that you've been waiting for, I'm pleased to turn it over to Emmett Emmett Duffy and his team uh, to lead us through the presentation. Well, hello everyone. Um, again, thanks Thanks for joining us. I'd, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the Lenfest Ocean Program and the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and the Moore Foundation for supporting this work, which we all think is important, and really for the vision for advancing a more comprehensive understanding of marine species and habitats in US waters. Uh, next, please. Uh, our motivation uh, for this work um, comes from the fact that the U.S. has the largest marine estate uh, of any nation in the world, totaling over 11 million square kilometers that stretches from the Arctic uh, Ocean to the remote uh, tropical Pacific islands. Uh, we all probably know that nationwide, 26% of the U.S. ocean waters are covered by uh, MPAs of some sort. Uh, the purpose of those MPAs, marine protected areas, is explicitly to protect uh, biodiversity, that is, species and habitats. But with a few notable exceptions, such as uh, the California network, we actually have relatively little knowledge of what is in those uh, places. Uh, next, please. And we need that data uh, on marine biodiversity to inform decisions of many kinds, um, including some that, that are really becoming uh, increasingly urgent uh, with the intertwined um, challenges of rapid climate change, which has been all around us in the last uh, week, couple of weeks, and biodiversity decline. So these include, for example, uh, the President's America the Beautiful Initiative, uh, the National Nature Assessment that's now underway, Conservation Stewardship Atlas, and as Chris mentioned, the Ocean Carbon Action Plan um, and Sustainable Blue Economy, all of which um, require or will benefit from data on what species uh, we have and where. Next, please. So this project uh, set out to address three goals. The first is to basically figure out a way to do uh, a national assessment or, or gap analysis of marine species and habitats um, at the national scale, that is across all of these waters and using existing data. This was a time-bound analysis. And what that means is first, um, evaluating, uh, well, in addition, then evaluating how well current marine protected areas uh, are covering that diversity. And then finally, to uh, align what we learn from that with the needs of management and policy, such as those uh, that we just mentioned. So next. Um, achieving those goals, as you will uh, understand, requires broad input and exer expertise, as well as uh, standing on the shoulders of giants uh, that Charlotte mentioned. So our first step was to convene a team of experts um, across 
conservation, planning, uh, biodiversity science, management, and so on. And what we did was to review a large number of, of case studies of what has worked in the past for national scale biodiversity assessments. Um, and that involved a lot of discussion, hence the name Marine Biodiversity Dialogues, and used that discussion to uh, develop this practical uh, time-bound framework, as, as we called it. Uh, so next, please. Fortunately, again, um, we have a strong foundation to build on. There's been decades of exploration and data assembly by many organizations. Uh, the Census of Marine Life was a, a really big one um, so, some years ago. Uh, and one of the products of that was the paper by uh, Fountain et al. that um, produced the first nationwide overview uh, of US marine biodiversity. Meanwhile, there has always been also been work both in the US and internationally to develop um, what the Global Ocean Observing System is, calls uh, essential ocean variables, including those in biology, which are shown at the bottom here, that really informed the way uh, we went forward. So next, please. So the first question that, that the team had to uh, address was what to measure, um, what to prioritize from the more than 200,000 described marine species uh, that are out there. And building on, on the goose, um, essential ocean variables, or EOVs, we focused on uh, four functional groups that seemed like the, the key things to, to know, to understand both healthy ecosystems um, and that are also important to society. And importantly, uh, where there is at least some data uh, available on a national scale to evaluate them. So these include habitat forming species that create habitat for others, uh, corals, seagrasses, and so on, species of conservation concern, including federally protected marine mammals, seabirds, turtles, uh, harmful organisms um, that have negative impact, impacts on both people and humans, so pathogens, invasives, and so on. And then supporting organisms, which are species that are otherwise important important in food webs uh, or as keystones. So th that's the biology that we focused on. Next, please. So in order to uh, proceed with a national assessment, um, we focused on those four groups, selected those biodiversity components, um, and then basically needed to assemble geo-referenced occurrence records, so records of the species that also tell us where they are. And this, this work was led by uh, Pat Halpin um, and the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab at Duke, um, who we'll hear from later as well. So species data, uh, the georeferenced species data were mostly from OBIS, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System. Um, the habitat distributions, uh, empirical and modeled, came from a variety of sources, uh, many of them from NCOS, the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science. And at this point, I am happy to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Jeannie Wilson, to uh, summarize what we found out. Thanks, Emmett. Um, next slide, please. So to give you an idea of some of our results, um, this is looking at the national scale, looking at all records within OBIS, as Emmett mentioned. Um, and on the left, we see the total number of species that have been found within the US EEZ is around 29,000. Um, and only a fraction of those are actually found within marine protected areas in the US and a quarter of them are found within fully protected areas. Um, the data in OBIS is collected using a lot of different methods, and so we subsetted it to look at just those data that are collected using visual standardized surveys, and that's the data, on, the figure on the right. Um, and so here, this is a species accumulation curve showing that basically when we use this subset of more similar data, we see that about a third of the species are unprotected, are not found in either MPAs or F uh, FPA, so marine protected areas or fully protected areas. Um, and we actually expect this to be an underestimate of how many species are not protected since we found a number of sampling biases, such as sampling is denser within protected areas than outside of protected areas. And so if we accounted for these, we would likely find more unprotected species. Um, but so this is giving us a, the coarsest picture at a national scale. Next slide, please. 
But we don't have to just look at this crude estimate of biodiversity, the total number of species. We can also apply some of the um, different criteria or look at different uh, criteria, as Emmett mentioned. And so we applied our framework to the available data in the US EEZ and assessed biodiversity within the context of the network criteria, which were established by the Convention on Biological, Biological Diversity. And so we can see just from this figure at a, at a very coarse level that at a national level, we get varying results depending on which criterion we're using. So starting at the top, we can we look at important areas of both marine mammals and birds. And here our target is 100% coverage because these are very important areas. So they're feeding grounds, they're breeding grounds, and we want them all to be covered by protected areas. Um, and we see that for both birds and mammals, we are far from that 100% protection goal, but for birds, we're a bit closer, about 50%, and marine mammals are significantly below even 30%. Um, and so just to reiterate here, the green is marine protected areas and the gold is fully protected areas. Um, and then looking at going clockwise around the circle, we see representativity, which is another network criterion. And here we're looking at several of the habitat forming species that Evan mentioned. Um, and so we see that only tropical corals exceed 30% for fully protected areas whereas seagrasses and mangroves exceed it for marine protected areas and cold water corals are much lower than 30% for both fully protected and just marine protected areas. And then finally, looking at adequacy and viability, these are measured by size um, of the MPAs by coverage and resilience in the face of climate. And we see that both size and coverage are below 30%, and that at this point in time, we don't have enough information to assess climate vulnerability, but we wanted to highlight it because this is an important future growth area. And so to summarize at the EEZ level, we are hitting some of these network metrics, um, but not others. And it's a very heterogeneous answer. But if, oh, sorry, next slide, please. But of course, we don't have to just look at the US EEZ, which is a huge area as one single network. We can also look at the individual ecoregions that are um, within the EEZ. And when we look at the ecoregional level, the picture gets even more complicated. So to illustrate this, we have two of our metrics. On the left is cold water representativity of cold water coral habitat. And on the right is the coverage of marine mammal important areas. Um, and so we can see that for the cold water corals, these occur in most of the ecoregions, but that there is really low coverage in all ecoregions outside of the Pacific Islands. Whereas for the important areas for marine mammals, they are, well, first of all, they're actually unassessed in many regions, and they are unassessed in, the, in most of the ecoregions within the Pacific Island area, um, which represents a huge data gap that's important to fill. But they are most well covered in South Florida, actually, where we're almost hitting that 100% coverage goal. And there's much lower coverage in the other ecoregions. Um, so we see that the coverage really does vary across ecoregions and is lacking in many locations. Next slide, please. And then finally, to further illustrate how variable biodiversity coverage can be across ecoregions, we have two examples, two extreme examples here. So on the left is Alaska, where only a small percentage of the many waters in Alaska are within marine protected areas. And then on the right are the Pacific Islands, which are actually close to that 30% target. And so we see on the right that even in the relatively well-protected region of the Pacific Islands, some species and habitats are still falling through the cracks. So there is little coverage of bird and marine mammal important areas, and there's also really low coverage of seagrass habitat. And then in contrast, on the left in Alaska, this is a large territory, but none of the biodiversity components actually reach 30%, the 30% target within marine protected areas. And so to summarize, we can see that both on an ecoregional level and as we look at these different criteria, our summary figure of 26% of US protection is very misleading. And Emmett will talk a little more about some of the data distribution and gaps in data. With the next slide. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, with the next slide. 
Um, thank, thanks, Sarah. So yes, we, we have uh, worked to knit all these data together to get the best picture that it, we believe is available from existing data for, at the national scale. But we, we also wanted to point out that there are continuing challenges uh, with assembling data on marine species and habitats at the national scale like this. Uh, a major reason because many of the data sources are only available for particular regions. And so, for example, uh, the data sets um, in the top right um, which you can't read, but the point is simply to show you that uh, a lot of the um, habitat models in particular uh, for, for habitats and um, avian abundance models, cetacean abundance models, and so on, um, have been done for particular reason, sorry, for particular regions, many on the East Coast, but we don't have those nationwide. And so it becomes quite difficult to really get a sense for, uh, for the national scale, especially for some of these migratory species. Um, the ones on the bottom, uh, we have uh, global data sets for, and so these are the ones that we, we ended up um, uh, using most intensively for uh, for the national scale assessments, but um, th this is where some of the major data gaps come in. Uh, next, please. And for uh, in increasing those data gaps, uh, we just want to plug it, put a plug in for focusing on the essential ocean variables. Um, derived by GOOSE, the Global Ocean Observing System, and the uh, related essential biodiversity variables. Um, ours was a, a, a was a way of, of implementing those in, in a real national scale assessment. Um, this slide is to show that people have thought a lot about this, and there are lots of complicated connections. So the challenge is often um, really honing in on what is feasible under the certain circumstances, which is where we went. But the, the key here is that this provides um, some guidance towards uh, going forward. So next, please. Uh, and toward that end, um, I'd like to return to um, some of the overarching goals that Charlotte and Chris brought up in the beginning, you know, toward that end of, of moving forward with this work, uh, we, we'd like to move now into the second phase of the Marine Biodiversity Project, which is now underway. Um, this one builds off the first in terms of using the data that we have on uh, abundance and distribution, or sorry, diversity and distribution. Um, but the goal here is to understand what those species and habitats are doing, not just where they are and who is there, but how uh, biodiversity, broadly speaking, contributes to uh, healthy functioning ecosystems uh, and the people who depend on them. So again, we what we want to do is operationalize this a uh, concept of biodiversity's functional role in marine ecosystems, which has uh, got a lot of academic attention in the literature, but not much application to management. And the way we're going about that is by identifying uh, key components, um, particular species and habitats, as we've discussed, that contribute to resilience um, and how people are interacting with them in ways that, that can inform practical decisions in management. And so uh, with that, I would like to uh, turn this over to my colleagues, again, uh, Stephen Cyphers um, and Gabrielle Canonico. And I'd also like to hear, um, also uh, call out our postdoctoral scholar, Dr. Kelsey Furman, who is uh, based with me at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center and is uh, leading the interviews and much of the analysis of these data. So uh, over to Stephen. Thank you, Emmett. Um, next slide, please. So I guess I'll just start by uh, introducing, you. you've met Emmett, Gabrielle, and I, so I'll introduce just a few of our other initial task force members. Um, we have Joey Bernhardt, who's an expert in biodiversity and linking to, to kind of nutrition and food security and, and a lot of human dimensions there. Um, Dr. Stephen Gray, who I'll mention again a little bit later on, is an environmental social scientist with an, his expertise in collaborative modeling. Um, Mandy Karnauskas is at the Southeast Fishery Science Center and leads a lot of their ecosystem science. Uh, Melissa Kinney is a decision scientist at University of Minnesota, so gives us another perspective on thinking about how uh, policy and social science of biodiversity can link with decision making through, you know, decision science pathways. And then uh, Ariana Sutton-Greer is at U.S. Geological Survey and has done a lot of work 
on coastal management issues, thinking uh, about biodiversity, environmental management, ecosystem services more broadly. And I'll just mention that this is really our initial task force. Um, as you'll see our project unfold and how we're gonna work through various regions, we'll build this group with additional experts kind of at the national level and hopefully some, some individuals who are very locally plugged in that might offer some lessons that are useful to transfer you know, beyond where they were to, to other parts of, of the country. Um, next slide, please. So as Emmett mentioned, our, our phase two project really focuses on the linkages between biodiversity and, and people. And a unifying theme of this part of the project is that these relationships are complex and they vary across space and across a whole bunch of different contexts. And so our research approach can kind of generally be described as we don't want to water down this complexity. Instead, we want to show it and show that there's many groups of people that understand it, hold unique knowledge about it, and can help us understand the types of, of interactions they have because it's really important about you know, how we manage biodiversity is to understand that it's not something that just occurs in nature without people. So we're approaching this through building collaborative models with scientific experts, local experts, and managers. And this approach has really been motivated by a long string of work uh, by several of our collaborators that are involved in this project and, and some that aren't. Uh, the one I want to specifically mention again is, is Dr. Stephen Gray, who is at Michigan State and really developed a lot of the ideas and the software that we use to, to do this type of work. And our, our postdoc, Dr. Kelsey Furman, has worked really closely with him prior to this project and, and on it. So we're excited about some of the, the inertia in terms of environmental social science, and then also the opportunity to merge with the really awesome momentum of this phase one uh, biodiversity dialogues project to try to make some, some progress in this space. Um, I also wanna briefly mention uh, another individual that's been really critical so far to the work we've done and, and where we're going is Ms. Sarah Gibbs. She's a PhD student in my group and really working with Kelsey closely on, on doing the interviews. And eventually as you'll see when we get into the case studies. But ultimately where we'll go um, with our project is we will build an overall conceptual model based upon the knowledge, beliefs, and, and priorities of individuals to look something like what you see uh, here on, on the screen. And this is a paper from uh, Payam Amanpour, who was a previous PhD student with, with Stephen Gray, and focused on describing how important it is to pool the knowledge of diverse groups of individuals to really understand uh, of big problems. And so we'll work on building an overall model of biodiversity and the linkages to the human elements. And then we're gonna try to take it to three case studies and apply it, but we've almost you know, described it ourselves as trying to break it because we wanna see it and, and see what doesn't work in various places and where are the local contexts, whether they're social or ecological, so important to understand that our general understanding you know, may need to be you know, rethought in various places. Next slide, please. And so these places that we're initially focusing on for the case studies uh, are the Salish Sea in the Northwest, Chesapeake Bay in the Mid-Atlantic, and then the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And I'll, I'll mention that we're, we're planning to start in the Northern Gulf of Mexico uh, in, this fall. Uh, so we're gonna just make a few more kind of comments on it. Next slide, please. So we decided to start on the Northern Gulf um, for, for a few reasons. First and foremost, it's an awesome system to look at biodiversity and its linkages to, to people. And I'm not at all biased on, on that kind of attitude. Um, but it's an area to where biodiversity is, is really important and its importance for people is, is really, really unique. And so the figure on the left is from the ecosystem status reports that NOAA puts together. This one came out of the Southeast Fisheries Science Center and was led by one of our task force members, Dr. Mandy Karnauskas, but a large team obviously goes to, to putting these reports together, but you can just look at the image and see some of the elements of the Gulf that interact with biodiversity, whether it's you know, the human activities like fishing, farming, you know, recreation, or whether it's, it's some of the, the more you know, broader climate type things that, that Chris mentioned in the introduction. And so really seeing how these things aren't individual elements of a system, but how they're all connected together in biodiversity is, is one of our goals of where we're going with this. 
you know, the Gulf is, is a system that hosts 1,400 finfish species, 50 shark species, and I think Gulf fisheries are somewhere around $10 billion. So it's an area where it's a very, very important system to do this. And it's also a system that's shown a lot of innovation with nature-based solutions. So um, I'll mention one last thing. We're going to specifically do this workshop in, in the Northern Gulf in coastal Alabama. A lot of folks don't know that Alabama's uh, river system where five rivers flow into it was described by the biodiversity scientist E.O. Wilson as America's Amazon, just because of how much biodiversity there is there and also how it's you know, threatened by various things. So it's a, it's a unique and it's an important and vulnerable system that I think we have a lot to learn from and also a lot to learn how people have you know, developed many sustainable relationships with biodiversity as well. So um, I'll pass to, to Gabrielle and, and say thank you again for, for listening to us today and, and looking forward to hopefully engaging a lot of you as we move forward. Yeah, thanks. Next slide, thank you. Um, when we began this work, we really saw an opportunity to focus on marine biodiversity, not through the lens of one specific management mandate, but really towards a more holistic understanding of its role in supporting ecosystem health and also human communities. So phase one started with documenting a framework for assessing marine biodiversity at multiple scales and understanding what biodiversity information we have readily available and where gaps exist. Um, but then recognizing that the term biodiversity means different things to different people and that it's measured in different ways in different places, phase two is bringing that framework into dialogues that you just heard about, um, where we hope to explore what diverse species and habitat mean to people and sustainability. And so these are our building blocks, again, um, standing on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of work behind this um, by other groups, but these are blocks that we believe are needed to inform assessments and decisions in response to a variety of mandates to accelerate action on climate, advance objectives um, articulated in the US Ocean Climate Action Plan, fill the data gaps we've talked about, and generally support an exchange of knowledge um, and truly an exchange across communities and sectors. So um, we really emphasizing that our projects are building on progress of the broader community to expand understanding of marine life status and trends and impacts of change by reaching across disciplines, engaging across levels of government, inviting these dialogues um, with groups outside of our, our disciplines and our routines. But there's a lot more to do, especially if our intention is to continue deepening that kind of engagement and jointly developing solutions with many different groups as we continue on. Um, so next month, we are part of planning for an event hosted by the National Oceanographic Partnership Program where a number of experts and managers will meet to discuss needs, gaps, opportunities for collection of biodiversity information um, that's being asked for to inform management, development, conservation, climate response. And then we hope to build momentum with that event towards a high level support um, and some commitments among leaders across sectors, really looking for those champions of this kind of approach to solidify ongoing collaborations and better align investments in biodiversity science and knowledge delivery with real on the ground needs for decision making. That Stephen talked about the case studies and those, in, the, those are good examples of the kinds of conversations that we need to invite if we're serious about building meaningful relationships within regions and among local communities. And from a national perspective, we will continue working with LenFest, the partners represented here um, in hopes of engaging with, with groups like yours and others. Um, so to that point, it's important to emphasize this is not an initiative that falls solely to governments at any level. I think that's represented by the participation on the task force um, and, and teams but rather we have the imperative to find shared and common ways to come together to build linkages across the range of knowledge holders and knowledge users, and to include the breadth of perspectives in our work if we really hope to sustain the living resources that we value and that we rely on um, on a daily basis. So I'm 
transitioning now, I think, to back to Chris. Actually, it may be to me so that, <laughs> so Chris can, so you all can catch your breath. Um, thank you all um, speakers. That was a tremendous amount of information. And I think, um, I think the, the exciting role Chris is gonna play here is, is I feel like I also learn a lot in discussion in hearing, um, hearing you talk about some of these results, conclusions, opportunities going forward. And so Chris, I am turning it to you um, to lead a discussion. And I believe um, our colleague Emily is gonna put everybody, all the panelists on screen um, who are participating. Thanks, Charlotte. And I just wanted to do a reminder to everyone, if you have questions in the audience, to drop it in the Q&A box versus the, the chat box. Um, so just a, just a helpful reminder to everyone. And we're gonna leave a lot of time for Q&A. Um, I first kind of want to turn to current events. It's really hard right now to turn on the news, to open the paper, and, and not see these extreme weather patterns that are happening both over land and in the sea. Think about globally, about 40% of the world is experiencing a marine heat wave right now. We're all hearing the numbers in Florida of uh, 100 degrees in the water. Um, obviously, those type of impacts and climate change are having impact on individual species, on ecosystems, their functioning, and ultimately the ability of the ocean to provide for people. So uh, I'm going to ask Gabrielle to kick us off and to say, based on what you're learning, how can science really help accelerate meaningful progress in protecting ecosystem health and resilience? Thanks for the question, and I hope others will weigh in too. Um, certainly, we know climate change and um, rapid development are causing shifts in the diversity and productivity of marine organisms, and that, the, that in turn results in impacts on human communities, some of which are sometimes severe. So one opportunity I think that we see in the data aspect of this conversation, um, where there would be real impact would be to address the need to make authoritative marine life information readily available in formats that are useful for documenting, predicting, quantifying those impacts on marine life, on human communities. Um, investment in a huge data coordination effort that makes available historical and existing data would transform um, the efforts that we, you know, the community has been taking with regard to biodiversity understanding and also for forecasting and mitigating change. Um, but science, I think, also has an opportunity to engage differently outside of the usual routines um, and disciplines in order to design approaches that can effectively translate our understanding of these shifts and science outcomes and data into information that's relevant for groups that are working to respond to change in real time. At the beginning of the webinar, Emily used the term co-design, um, referring to that process where science and operational groups and communities are engaging together in an iterative process over time, back and forth, to define requirements for collection and sharing of information and really advance um, real coordinated efforts focused on delivery of usable information. And I would just say that's not an intuitive process. It's really outside of our business as usual in the science and observing communities, and it often has to be facilitated, but our success in designing science um, for application and to really understand um, and respond to change in that way is, is critical for meaningful progress. So I, I'd be interested if other panelists have different perspectives. I think you covered it, Gabrielle. <laughs> great, no, you did a great job covering that. Thanks, Gabrielle. Um, Emmett, I actually might turn to you and then ask other people to weigh in too. Um, one of the findings from the work is that we need more data. We have a lot of regions that don't have data coverage. I sometimes think when people hear that we need more data, they think that means that we have to slow up taking action. So I, I'd like to talk to you to, to talk a little, a little bit about how do we you know, manage in the absence of the data so that this is a progressive learning and action type of process? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we do need more data, um, especially for poorly known regions and kinds of organisms. But 
uh, we have more than enough knowledge and data to make informed decisions for a lot of the questions that, that we're, we're interested in. I mean, we know from many prior studies that, um, you know, strong area-based protections uh, allow ecosystems to rebound and thrive. There are many data showing for a variety of kinds of marine ecosystems that fishes and other species are more abundant, more diverse, and bigger. Um, in well-protected areas. And I emphasize well-protected there. We also know that um, generally speaking, protected areas are more effective if they're larger. Um, not rocket science, but that's really important because these are things that are possible for, for management and policy to, to address. Um, you know, we also know that marine species are moving with, with the warming waters. There's lots of uh, evidence of that. And that's going to be very important in terms of uh, changing the systems that people depend on for, uh, you know, for, for livelihoods and, and tourism and fishing and so on. Um, where we need data there, I think, is understanding what are sometimes called who the winners and losers are among those species, which species are, are moving into ecosystems, out of other ecosystems, and, and how does that um, uh, in, how does that influence what they do for people? Um, but we, we, we don't need to wait for that to begin uh, figuring, you know, to, to begin doing better protection and, and understanding that we need to, um, if we want to protect these ecosystems, that they, they need to take into account the fact that uh, boundaries are, are not going to protect, are not going to prevent species from moving in and out with climate change. Thanks, Emmett. Does anybody else want to comment on that one? Great. Um, Stephen, I want to ask you a question. So you talked about um, the the work that's going on with uh, the part two, I would say, and the need for a broader engagement um, for uh, sources of knowledge and input. So I'd love to hear how you think um, you're bringing that broader engagement into the second task force. And I'm going to pick up a question that was on the chat about how many tribes have also been approached to contribute to the to the research as well, too. So if you could talk a little bit about that as also. Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and I'll start by picking up a, a thread from, from Emmett's comments before. And it's that, you know, for, for a lot of this, the, the ecosystems are changing on their own. And then, you know, we layer on our decisions of how we manage these systems. And sometimes those invoke other changes. And, and a lot of times the social science side is really also about trying to understand or predict the winners and losers. You know, who are the people that are likely to be impacted positively by some sort of environmental change or management? And who are the ones that may likely, you know, take a negative consequence from it? And how do we, and we as a collective society or the decision makers, you know, have systems in place that help understand those trade-offs and then integrate them into decision-making? And, you know, honestly, at this point, we don't know. I mean, that's where that's why we brought decision scientists into the task force is to try to understand how are these things sorted out in agencies currently and what might it look like if we, you know, went with a blank slate and tried to think about managing for biodiversity differently. And so I think that's some of the stuff that we will continue to to focus on when we have you know task force meetings and eventually our, our in-person meetings. Um, so that's where we're going. You know, the the who is at the table is something we've spent a lot of time and, and honestly still aren't fully comfortable with because it, it's always going to be one of those scenarios of if you're not at the table, raise your hand. You know, we know that's a that's a really bad scenario to end up in. And so um, I think our, our full team um, strives to make sure that we have the diversity and representation of all sorts of people. And I'm even trying not to frequently use the word stakeholder here because I know that's not, you know, an appropriate term when we're talking about dealing with tribal and indigenous communities because their relationships are important and unique and they're effectively managers of the system. So we've had those conversations about how you even situate our project in these, these interactions. Um, specifically to answer the question, I don't have a number for you. I can say we've had a few direct conversations on which groups, whether it be specific tribes or higher level organizations and groups that may represent multiple tribes or liaisons within agencies that help you know, with consultation processes, 
But I can confidently tell you for our whole group, we are all ears on ideas and advice uh, if you want to. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in on this, but I will say, I think some of our conversations on this, in addition to just the LenFest program's own motivations for it, has played a role in the other RFP, because this is certainly something that, that is you know, critically important. Stephen, I'll just add that I am along those lines. I, I suspect that our outreach um, to indigenous groups, other kind of local uh, resource users and owners is, is going to ramp up as we go into these use cases, because in so many of these cases, it's, it's really place-based uh, communities that, that are concerned about their particular resources, um, as we all are, you know, and, and where we've been so far is really thinking a lot about how do we structure this at, at the higher level, although Kelsey is now going into interviews on the ground within uh, some of these communities. So we, we think that's going to ramp up. Thanks, Emma and Stephen, I appreciate that. Charlotte, maybe I'll just turn really quickly to you, just um, because of the, you've been using this project to do even more marine biodiversity work and talked about the, the new RFP. Um, and I think Emmett made the very important connection that there needs to be more of that to actually in integrate into the work. So I'd love to just kind of hear about what LenFest is doing both the expansion of the biodiversity, but in particularly engaging with tribal and indigenous knowledge and wisdom. Sure, and and thank you. I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think the, you know, we have the the program itself, and and I think I, I'll speak for myself, but I know the team would echo this. We've been on our own journey to understand not just um, with indigenous people, indigenous and native peoples. But frankly, all stakeholders, not they are not stakeholders, they're landowners and, and managers, but with all individuals that we don't reach through um, what can be a very ivory tower grant making philanthropic process. And so the, the program itself has uh, spent the past several years digging into what can we do better than we do now. Um, Clearly, um, this is one area that we identified very early or something we could do something about now, which is creating an opportunity, an open call, specifically to in uh, elevate indigenous knowledge and wisdom and include it where it can be included in decision-making processes. And so I think that, uh, hopefully that's a signal um, that we are serious and, and clear about our intentionality. I will also say whenever, whenever you're serious and clear though, you also still have a lot to learn. So there's certainly gonna be mistakes we make. <laughs> They're going to be, um, you know, I'm sure uh, challenges in front of us, but I think the, um, the way we as a program think about including knowledge and thinking about information generation as a program has shifted and will probably um, continue to grow in that aspect as, as we are here. Thanks, Charlotte. Okay, I have one more question before we turn to the audience. This is like gonna be the rapid round question. Um, if there's one top message or point that you would like the audience to take away from this presentation and this work, I would love for each of the panelists to say so now. And I'm gonna start with Pat. From the data perspective, um, one of our biggest challenges is finding common and comparable and representative data. <clears throat> so there could be really excellent data collected for individual MPAs, but if we're not collecting the same data across multiple MPAs, it's very hard to do these kind of comparative national assessments. So it's the lowest common denominator problem that is a real challenge for us. Pat, I'm gonna add something to that. I think that it really in involves the federal agencies themselves, making sure they're talking to each other and sharing the data is, is an important first step too. So thank you for that. Sarah, can I turn it over to you next? Yeah, um, yeah, data sharing is super important. And something Pat just mentioned made me think of something. So we need to coordinate efforts to collect biodiversity data across MPAs, but also one of the results that we found was that we're collecting more data inside the MPAs than outside. And so we actually have this bias and we need to you know, pair those collections with sites that are outside of protected areas to know what the effects of protection are. Thanks, that's a great point. Steven. You know, I was also reading through some of the comments and the questions in the chat. And I, I think a couple of elements here. One is, you know, 
what does data even mean to various stakeholders? What does evidence mean? And if you're thinking of it in, in any point in time, you may be discounting history and long important history, or if you're looking into the future, you know, how, how do you even describe that? And so honestly, my mind is kind of spinning from those, those comments because they're, they're so good and the questions are good that I think those are things that, you know, I have on my list to bring back up as we continue to have these meetings and just think about even how we're, you know, don't be such a scientist type thing, how we can talk about the evidence that we put together more in these in these meetings with with diverse groups. So that's probably not the best answer, but that's what I'm thinking <laughs> through at the moment anyway. Fair enough. Good point. Uh, Gabrielle. Uh, yeah, it, the comments that I'm hearing are resonating with me. Um, the idea of um, comparative data collection within and outside of MPAs is really important, especially as moving animals are not recognizing boundaries that we establish. Um, but also the um, importance of standard approaches to collecting, maybe not collecting in some cases, but certainly managing and sharing the data and making those historical data from a diversity of sources available as part of that data commons just really rises to the top for me as something we can achieve, um, especially in, you know, in some of these community conversations. So thanks. Thanks. Emmett? Yeah, the, all the comments resonate with me too. I, I, you know, my main point, I think, kind of at a high level is, is about why we're focusing on biodiversity um, as opposed to big fish or or you know seafood products or whatever. And you know, I think the way the way I think about it is is that we're trying to make it clear that the species and habitats um, in our marine waters are central important actors in their own right in the way these systems work, just as people are. They're not ornaments, so to speak, that, that we're saving. We, we, we do want to protect them for their own right. We uh, Many of us feel an ethical and moral obligation to that, as well as a utilitarian one. But we, we also, it's important to understand how they interact with one another. So this, this is a very, um, these are dynamic systems. They're not just lists of species. And th there is, we, we, Coming back to Chris's question earlier about do we know enough? We know a lot about how they work. There, there are uh, many things we would like to know, but I think it's important to understand that, you know, the, these are these are important actors just as we are in in how these systems work together. Great, thank you very much. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte and Emily for questions from the audience. Thanks so much, Chris. And I think what we'll do is I will um, read out the questions uh, that are in the Q&A box and I will then, you know, panelists jump in where you feel like you have an answer. Um, and I will rely on Emily to jump in and tell me what I'm missing um, along the way that is showing up in the chat box. But I'll start at the top and please also um, forgive me as I, if I pronounce whether it's a species name or a type of data wrong along the way. but. We're going to start at the top and, and go down. Um, so the first question is, would you also be focusing on species that are experiencing latitudinal shifts? I can take a shot at that one. Um, uh, great question. Uh, we did actually look at the distribution of species and uh, for fish species in the ocean adapt data set and looked at how the composition of those species in current MPAs would be changing through time based on those predictions and their movements, and ultimately opted to just kind of focus more on the present with the data sets that we included. Um, however, I would like to see this work um, evolve to be something that's sort of repeated as we add to our MPA network, as we potentially include other conservation measures, spatial conservation measures that are in place. Um, and as we get better data. So uh, much as the way that we have a terrestrial gap analysis program, which is kind of repeated periodically, it would be ideal if this work were to kind of evolve into something like that and eventually include data like the one you mentioned. Thanks. And Jesse, you may want to answer this question or Pat, was GBIF, I know there's a better way to say that. I know there's a, a, a term for that. Was that data in, uh, in this? What's it called? GPIF. It's what I thought, but then I thought if I said that, it would even be worse. So 
is, was GBIF data con considered for inclusion? Yeah, it's another very good detailed question. Um, we did not pull data directly from GBIF. Our assumption is that most of the data that's in OBIS, uh, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, is flowing to GBIF and provides the marine backbone for GBIF. My understanding is there probably are data sets in GBIF that are not in OBIS. Um, and so again, if we're thinking about building a, a kind of an approach that we would exercise in the future, that's a good, a good point, another data set that we could include. Great. And I will also say those of you who are typing questions in the chat, some of them are actually being answered um, in the Q&A box. So if you do not hear me read your question, also check the answered tab because some of them are, are um, have written answers included. Um, next question. Other than scientists, NGOs, and funding organizations, what are the national mandates, policies, acts, and agency directions that require and need and want this biodiversity information? If there are many, are these well integrated, coordinated, and well funded? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> That's a couple different pieces there. I think Emmett um, showed a good slide just capturing several of the mandates and policies that we you know, have in mind when we're talking about or hearing about the need for coordinated biodiversity information. But that said, um, requirements for, um, you know, understanding uh, how ecosystems are functioning across taxa beyond, for example, um, single species surveys that are routinely collected, those those requirements show up in um, eco ecosystem assessment activities that different agencies are implementing or <clears throat> regulatory activities that um, trigger requirements for um, environmental and species information um, for offshore development. The, 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 the needs are huge and the mandates are many and they're diverse. And um, I think one challenge is that we really do need to think about how we're coordinating investments in collection of biodiversity information. Um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for better integration and coordination and funding of these kinds of initiatives um, in ways that we're advancing some common best practice-based approaches that meet a whole host of needs. So it's maybe not a satisfying answer, but that is the landscape that's really motivating this kind of conversation. And I appreciate the question. Charlotte, if I could just jump in on this, this one, because I think it's actually a really important question. Just want to underline something here is it, it, it truly is true that we're not going to get a good grasp on how climate is going to affect our planet without having a really good grasp on ocean and ocean species and habitats are absolutely critical to carbon sequestration that that's that's happening so it's we we need to make sure that when we talk about this we move beyond just thinking about biodiversity in a very limited framework and recognize that understanding this is absolutely critical to understanding our climate and keeping it healthy which is absolutely as we're all learning uh, critical to both businesses and and communities and one of the things that I do think the federal government really lacks is um, who, who's trying to coordinate. We have a lot of different agencies that collect information. They collect it in a lot of very different ways. And we really do need someone, this is sometimes called environmental intelligence now, and we understand that data is so important to so much that we do. And so this is a really important question because it's something we do have to grapple with. like who's gonna to try to help take the lead so that we're gathering the data and putting it out there in a way that people have mentioned that is actually usable to the consumers of this information for strong decision-making. So we need to do a, a lot more and, and I actually believe we can be more effective with funding if we know who's, lane, who's in which lane and how we're gonna coordinate those efforts together. Thank you both. So the next question is, the Atlantic didn't seem to be a focus area and they're wondering why. And this is in particularly in relationship to the North Atlantic right whale and its status as being critically endangered um, and, and what it means by not, you know, is this a signal by you all that that's not a, a priority for you? 
Um, I don't think that we uh, ignored the Atlantic. We actually looked at all of the regions in the United States uh, marine territory. Um, we didn't drill down to the finest level on some of these, but for example, for the Atlantic right whale, um, you know, what, what we showed, I, well, for, for marine mammals in general, is that the biologically important areas, places that are, you know, important for breeding and feeding, uh, in some cases have not been assessed or are not protected. And, and those are, of course, going to be critical. Interestingly enough, it, um, one of the few on the East Coast that did have high protection of these was in uh, South Florida. And if I'm not a whale guy, uh, but if I remember correctly, that is one of the uh, one of the places where the where the right whales come in. Uh, probably Pat or somebody else could could uh, uh, speak to that. So maybe one comment. I think Jesse also has um, in the assessment um, for eco region wide um, distribution and abundance of models. We used models of North Atlantic right whale as, as well as other cetaceans. So they were were definitely included. And Emmett already mentioned the biologically important areas, which NOAA has designated, which are areas that are important for breeding, feeding, migratory corridors, and they were also included, but they don't have any protections. So those are identified management areas, but they're not fully protected. And so that, that is one of the distinctions. So we definitely were looking at the US Atlantic coast and it was one of the more data rich regions um, in, in the analysis. Jesse, you have further comments or? Yeah, just to add, um, so on the right whale particularly, for me, this highlights you know, that we looked at uh, marine protected areas as listed by you know, the NOAA's MPA center, right? So there's a definition of how these protected areas get included. That's what we assessed. However, there are several comments here, and I highlighting Jay O'Dell made a comment about this as well, that there are other what we could call OECMs or other effective conservation measures, which do have a spatial footprint that are targeted for particular habitats or particular species. For example, seasonal management areas for right whales or dynamic management areas for right whales or cold water coral management areas that the fishery management councils on the East Coast have put in place. And so those were not assessed in terms of their coverage over the data that we were assessing. And again, I think that um, were we to do this again, we would want to, I think, explore some of those other spatial management measures, which do exist uh, in lots of different places in terms of, and, and look at the biodiversity uh, or individual species or habitats that are being captured or protected with those measures. Thanks. That's a really important point, Jesse. And just on top of that, I, I'd note that the reason we didn't um, include the OECMs, the other, you know, effective conservation measures, is because they're they're. If I'm still up to date on this, the United States has not adopted a formal uh, criterion for that in our waters. Is it, and you know, perhaps if we were doing it again, we would say, okay, well, regardless of that, let's at least consider the following things. But that that would be up to to Jesse and Pat since you guys did that work. I'm just going to jump in real quick, Charlotte, uh, given your interest in the topic, David, I'm just sharing in the chat another project, separate project. We did fund some work on North Atlantic right whales previously that was looking at right whales and changes in oceanography and how it's changing their feeding habits. So um, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Emily, and everybody. <laughs> Very helpful. Uh, the next question is, are the percent coverage estimates based on extent of the EEZ? Yeah, that was that was sort of the spatial denominator that we used, although we did break it up into these ecoregions. So we both did for the entire US EEZ as a denominator, if you will, for kind of coverage percentages, as well as these individual ecoregions as polygons and what kind of coverage um, we could see within each of those, yes. Great. The next question is in reference to a paper, Smith et al., that was in Global Change Biology that is talking about heat waves, um, which says a marine protected area network does not confer community structure resilience to a marine heat wave across coastal ecosystems. And the question is, how would your ambitious knowledge network address the important conceptual gap in protection that this study reveals? I, 
I can take one crack at that. You know, marine protected areas obviously are not a panacea for every problem we face. And, um, you know, we know, for example, that coral reefs are bleaching regardless of whether they're in or outside of protected areas. You know, what I think the, um, you know, the, the data uh, the, the ambitious knowledge network, uh, as as uh, the, the questioner mentioned, where I think that can help is is helping to identify uh, places within the ocean where um, temperature vulnerability is perhaps less than it is elsewhere, and you know being able to use some of this information for targeting um, areas for for protection, whether by it through MPAs or other effective conservation measures that that are able to maintain um, species that that are that are threatened by climate. That's that's one possibility. Great. Um, the next question starts with thanks for the effort and the great work. Um, the question is: Besides identifying supporting species, is there an effort to identify? Key species that enhance the inherent ecological resilience of each system. For example, in Hawaii, coral reef herbivores are essential and terribly overfished. Happy to take that one also. Um, I will say at, at a high level, that was the rationale for identifying these, um, what we called the four biodiversity components. So in other words, the reason for focusing on foundation species, of course, such as corals and seagrasses, mangroves, is that those are um, provide habitat for everybody else. So they clearly are influencing the rest of the system. Um, in, in this Mark specific example here of, of uh, Hawaiian reefs, you know, I, I would say, uh, herbivores would be, uh, you know, parrotfish or, or other herbivores would be the, the kind of group that one could target in that, um, what we called supporting organisms. You know, that, that was a category that was, we, we basically um, wanted to use so that people who are doing these assessments um, who, who have knowledge of the species within their systems that are important, you know, could, could really uh, emphasize that. So, for example, in the National Marine Sanctuaries, some of the, the uh, monitoring that goes on targets particular species that are known to be important in the ecology, such as the black spine uh, sea urchin diadema in the Caribbean. So um, that potential is there. We haven't gone down to that level within individual um, regions, but that, that was part of the rationale for, for that um, classification. Great. Um, the next question, is there research to do a mathematical analysis of the developed area's contribution to atmospheric heat to the increase in ocean temperature? I think I would need a little more information on what specific definition of developed areas. Are we talking about terrestrial developed areas in a global scale analysis? I'm sorry, it's hard to field that question specifically. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think we can we can potentially follow, we can follow up if, um, if that questioner has um, more specific uh, details there, we can certainly follow up. Um, Next question, was your work and analysis designed so they can be easily repeated as data accumulates and gaps close? Yes, the operative word is easily, but... Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> easily sorry. by a group of experts, right. Um, so I'm sure Sarah can feel this, but the, you know, the first paper will be coming out hopefully soon that will describe these methods and the process. So, so the data is very transparent in how methods were, were done and definitely should, should be repeated. And Jesse's mentioned this already, we would very much think it would be extremely beneficial to repeat this as new data comes online and as time passes. So, um, so repeatability is something we feel is, is ought to be an, an objective into the future. Sarah or Jesse? Go ahead, Sarah. We're, um, yeah. 
Uh, Jesse, you're probably better for answering this, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely a goal and we're, we're working on it and all of the, you know, all of the data that was used is publicly available and all of the code will be available online. Um, so we hope that this will be something that will be easily able to be repeated. And just one thing, I think if we are to make this repeatable too, I think the generation of data that we would include, if we have a sense of that, that those data sets, those models are going to come online to feed into something like this, I think that also will help um, both that we have developed the code and approach, but that data sets are kind of being more uh, tailored for use of this kind uh, at a national scale. Charlotte, if I can weigh in one more time about this repeatability issue, <laughs> of course. I, I think one of the things that we hope is that the federal government will use this as an opportunity to work with a number of different partners and similar to what USGS does for their gap analysis and the work they do, take this up for the ocean um, as well. As Emmett mentioned, we have one of the largest EEZs in the in the world. It's much larger than our landmass. And so it's been an oversight not to have this type of work being repeatedly done for our oceans to make sure that we are actually managing them effectively. Great, thank you. The, these are these are great answers, and I I, I know this is uh, we keep we're going to keep there are many more questions and and they keep adding to the Q and A, so I'm going to keep going um, for at least another nine minutes. Um, uh, the questioner says, "Great presentations, thank you." Gabrielle is currently talking about co-designing research questions. I'm curious the extent to which you're engaging with local and indigenous knowledge systems along with science that may have varied definitions of data and epistemological basis. I'll start if others will weigh in. Um, I think Stephen had actually mentioned in the context of the, the use cases. So this phase two of our project is taking a focus on Salish Sea, Chesapeake Bay, and the northern Gulf of Mexico. And that was a hard decision to arrive at three. We needed to bound our activity. It's only a several year project. Um, there are other regions of interest with similar challenges. Um, with regard to resource management, but um, certainly as we get into the local engagements and the, those use cases, um, we've we've already been thinking quite a lot and having some um, very interesting conversations with potential um, tribal representatives and you know other groups that can help to bring these perspectives into the conversations. I do see. Thank you um, to one of the participants who made a suggestion for Salish C in the chat. And I think we're very open to suggestions of groups to engage with as we work in these three geographies for the use cases coming up. Um, you know, I and that's um, more around engaging with those groups in the context of this project to understand perspectives and under and um, interaction with biodiversity. Um, I think there are other opportunities for um, designing with these groups, um, the science and for example, observing activities that we undertake. Um, some of which are outside the scope of this project, but certainly things that we are also thinking about. Do others want to weigh in on that comment? In the interest of time, in case anybody is dying to, I'm going to keep going so we can get through a few more questions. I know we, because um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, next question is, you have shown us distribution data. You mentioned the need to develop information on interactions. How do you anticipate acquiring functional or dynamic data? Yeah, that's the holy grail, if I might say it that way, um, at least in terms of the ecological, you know, biophysical aspect uh, of, of the biodiversity. You know, there is a lot of progress recently uh, in the direction of, you know, understanding and classifying interactions, uh, simply knowing who the species are and how large they are and that sort of thing. So trait-based um, models of, of interactions you know, are a start. Um, there's been a lot of interest there in marine fishes, for example, because there's good data. Um, you know, there will undoubtedly need, that. that's another phase. That's not gonna happen in this project. Um, you know, another development that I think is making this um, 
more possible is the use of metabarcoding for stomach contents, for example, which is allowing potentially really um, high resolution um, data on feeding networks. So th those are a couple of possibilities um, that, that could move in that direction. But that, that's going to be a harder job, obviously, than just figuring out where they are. Absolutely. Next question, or it starts with a statement. There's a federal request for information out now on developing a national strategy for planning for sustainable ocean economies. The work y'all are doing seems very relevant. Hope your team and partners will weigh in on the importance of more robust biodiversity data and frameworks for incorporating them now in planning and management decisions, as that is critical to assuring sustainability. I also hope that there is broad community response with comments like that in um, submitted to, the, to that process. So I thank you for the comment. I think it's an important one. And I hope that, you know, some among you are considering how you would respond to the RFI. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going until Emily cuts me off. I did not see bivalves in the species protection list. Do you think that a nonprofit that focuses on a species such as the Eastern oyster, which has been shown to restore habitat, could effectively act as an intermediary with more rapid response, but followed by the science studying species impact? I did not see oysters on the list of protected species, though I might've missed it. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. I think it gets to, um, our rationale in talking about functional groups uh, of species as opposed to individual species. So for example, we, um, we looked at uh, what we called habitat forming species. The Eastern oyster is absolutely a habitat forming species as well as an, obviously a, an important fishery species. So I would say that that um, would, uh, would certainly um, be in that group. We did not map uh, oyster um, oysters uh, as as we did for seagrass and and mangroves and so on in part I think because there's just there just are not the data layers uh, available to do that on a national scale although uh, Pat or, or Jesse might might be able to comment there um, so a couple real quick responses there um, I totally agree with Emmett's response that they were included in the analysis as habitat forming species. Um, so they weren't in the column of protected species. Um, bivalves were a species that would have been recorded in the OVIS data. So there could have been many observations of, of various bivalve species that were used in the analyses. And one other quick comment is a lot of the oyster and oyster restoration sites are very close to shore in. A, in waters that may have been out, you know, not in federal waters in MPA areas that were considered things. So there's some geographic constraints as well. I could go into more detail, but hopefully a couple of points. Charlotte, I see we do one more question, which okay. I, I noticed what it was, and I think it's an important question to get out there, but um, and then we'll we'll end. Okay, I'm not sure which question you're talking about. Um, it is the, the hesitation around the word stakeholder. Ah, okay. Um, yes, let me scroll. Thank you. Um, question. I noticed the hesitation to using the word stakeholder. Can you explain more about the connotations of that word that I may not be aware of or point us, point me to a resource to learn more? Well, I, I can I can take an initial response to this, but I would welcome anybody else to chime in. And I'll, I'll acknowledge that, that some of this is me still learning myself, and, and it was motivated by some conversations among our team. Um, Dr. Furman, who's our postdoc, had previously done a lot of work in Alaska and worked in, in communities where my understanding is that, 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 one, the term just doesn't resonate well with the, the people of those communities. So one, it's just not a good scientific approach if the term doesn't match or is not inclusive enough for the folks that we want to, to you know, be represented or understand their perspectives. And second, um, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I think there's some uh, historical connotation to staking a claim of land that 
is is not um, well aligned with our our ideals on indigenous and, and tribal peoples. So um, I think those are the two things. Um, I, I don't have any resources to share on that. It's something that I still would love to learn and read more about myself. But thank you for asking the question. So, well, Emily, I might, I know there are many more questions still in the q and I would say that we are more than happy to try to field those questions and get back to you on some of them if, um, although I might turn it to Emily on how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did put my email in the chat. I'll drop it in there again. Um, and so if you want to reach out to us and, you know, um, feel free anytime. We have too many questions that we can get to, but we're always willing to engage and, and connect people to the task force leads. And I just want to thank everybody for their comments and their questions. Um, we download the Q&A, we download the chat, so we get to see everything and be able to think about this and incorporate it into the work going forward. And that's why we do these events. So we can hear that and listen and continue to adapt along the way as we do the research. So thank you so much to everybody for joining. Thank you so much to the panelists for taking the time. And we look forward to continuing this journey on all of this. Thank you.